Hello, everybody. Um, today, Martin is not able to join us in the session, so I'm chairing this particular session um, on retrofit, refurbishing and repurposing older buildings. Um, this is the penultimate session, so it's already looking into the future and it's looking particularly um, this week at the education that um, various traders in the field um, are receiving and we have three speakers, um, one of whom is going to be talking about training current builders, the other is going to be talking about training architects, and the third is going to be talking about training all other professionals. I'm going to actually ask Trish to introduce the other professionals and give us an overall view of what she does. Trish? Do you um, want to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, I'm Trish Andrews. I'm an architect and I currently work for the CB as their training manager. Um, basically, we are involved in training anyone who's interested in understanding low energy um, buildings, including retrofit. And today I am going to discuss uh, what we offer training professionals and what the ACB is doing to try and scale up the profession and wider construction industry. And do you want to get started with your presentation? Yeah, okay. If I'm first on, that's definitely <laughs> fine. <laughs> Let me just share my screen. Um, okay, here goes. Is that working? Um, at the moment, I haven't got anything. Okay. Have a look, technology is great. Hmm. This is looking promising. Here we are. Here we are. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'm going to rapidly run through the ECB and what we do. So thanks very much for inviting us here today because, you know, we are involved very much so in retrofit refurbishment and repurposing buildings. Um, so briefly, who on earth are we, I guess, is what you're interested in. Oh, this doesn't seem to be going to the next slide. There we go. Um, well, we're basically uh, a membership uh, company, an organization. Uh, we have been uh, growing since 1989, where we um, share uh, best practice between companies, individuals, and organizations about how to promote sustainable building. Um, part of what we do is we train people, um, we give them advice and we help promote sustainable building best practice uh, through those mechanisms. Oops. Forward. Um, and how we do it is through our training, through our knowledge base and through the low energy building uh, database, which we hold showing how you can do projects. So I guess, what do we offer? I've just put down a couple of our main training courses there for you. Uh, so the first one is our original course founded in, I think, 2016, prior to me being there, uh, which basically is an entire holistic course, uh, which I'll go into detail in a minute if anyone's interested. Uh, retrofit coordination course. So this isn't actually um, training retrofit coordinators per se, but everybody involved in retrofit coordination and the retrofit process under the PARS. Uh, we also do CPD, and here I've just put down our largest CPD uh, course, which is building energy modelling using PHPP with uh, TU Dublin. And then we do bespoke courses uh, for various providers, organisations, and just generally interested people. I've just put in there in the slide that we actually do write standards. A lot of people are not sure that we actually, you know, do produce standards for the UK. Um, and one of our main standards is prevalent to today's talk is obviously the retrofit standard, and I guess probably the water standard as of recent events. Um, so they are available for people to look and look at targets and help to achieve if they're interested. Um, in terms of our targets, we sort of look really as a basic, our main ACB criterion is to look at space heating demand. So 
very poignant in today's energy crisis. So how can we get that demand down for house households? And what you'll see there is some of the basic low energy standards on the left and where their average housing standards in the UK are. So what we do through our standards and trying to encourage people through our training is to actually get a reduction of 60% plus on 1990 space heat demands. Um, and our current, you know, sort of average space heat demands in the UK, which sort of range, if you look there, anything from 80 to nearly 190 kilowatt hours um, per square metre per year. Uh, and our job in our training is actually to try and help people get that down. So where are we with training? Um, we know in the construction industry that over 40% of our emissions comes from our industry. And so we have a huge responsibility, but opportunity to significantly reduce these emissions. And obviously we're looking at trying to drive that in line with our legally binding targets to reduce by 78% by 2035. Now just think of that in your head. How can I reduce my <laughs> personal household space heating targets and emissions by that percent? It's a big, it's a big road. Um, there's lots to be done. We think there's roughly 350,000 full-time equivalent workers needing, for, needing in the industry to help us change to do this by 2028, according to the Climate Change Committee. But basically, as a training provider, we are trying to look at what are the key skills that we can help with with the knowledge that we currently have. Um, obviously, the training sector is demand-led, so we have to actually create that demand. Householders, local authorities, organisations and the government have to start to help people to ha uh, have an uptake into the opportunities that are out there. The majority of our homes obviously will be already there by in 2050. And it's interesting that a recent report by the UK Green Building Council said that actually 95% of our emissions um, in the next 30 years will be coming from the existing buildings that exist today. So that's quite a high proportion. But we see it as an opportunity for growth to try and get the training out there and to try and help people just turn towards looking at um, climate mitigation in terms of how we heat our homes and our buildings in the UK. One of the other things that is quite poignant to how the ACB delivers any of its advice and training is sufficiency. And that's where we always look at the existing structures first. Can they be reused? Can they be retrofitted? Can they be um, designed smaller uh, or anything at all to reduce the impact of any building work, whether it's retrofit or new build in the first instance? So I think that's a step change for the industry, but it's important to look at, particularly when we're training. So this is our first course. We call it the Carbon Light Retrofit Foundation course. Um, it was cited in the government's heat and building strategy in 2021 as a holistic way of, um, um, I guess, looking at how we decarbonise buildings and heatings in the UK. So it's our oldest course. Um, it's quite large. So it has, um, it's aimed at construction pro professionals mainly, but we have a lot of people as individual homeowners who come on it and through our student support and the way that we've designed the assessment, we help them through understanding some of the most technical things, um, but above all, how to do a whole house plan, I guess, as to how they want to retrofit their, their building um, right now or in a series of stages or phases as they have or money allows. Um, it's quite long, it's 130 hours, 72 lessons, and it does go towards those who are, I guess, passive house um, designers and installers to get 35 um, passive house um, institute credits towards their training. Um, so what does it involve? It looks at our carbon light approach. So, you know, what are energy targets? What should we be looking at? Uh, what is carbon light uh, retrofit? How do we do it? Uh, we look at climate, where is your building? It's quite an important part of looking at how you assess it and try to mitigate the impacts of climate as you retrofit. Um, 
we also look at, I guess, UK construction, because there's various methods of that out there, how that may be applicable to your type of building. And then we look at the heat and energy that you need in your building. And we have uh, developed stock modeling, where we look at different types of scenarios, how much building, uh, building typology loses heat, what's the best things to do uh, within the retrofit program of your house or building. It's not just for domestic retrofit. The big module that we do look at is moisture and air quality. Now we're not expecting everybody to understand and be an expert and an accessor. That's why we have specialists. But we do need you to understand, I guess, how um, moisture gets into buildings, uh, when it can get in and how to mitigate that and make a plan for that to decrease. Um, so that's quite a large module and it's very technical, but it does help people understand what type of moisture um, infiltration that they have in their buildings and what type of moisture to try and negate when they're making um, any refurbishment or retrofit measures within their property. Then we look at case studies. So we have lots of different types of case studies um, and scenarios, depending on what type of building that you have, uh, to try and show you how you can put a whole house plan into action. We look at building services, but not from the point of view of actually being building service specialists, but the type of uh, ventilation, which is really important when you retrofit, and the types of um, heat recovery and air tightness uh, that are important when you make decisions about altering existing buildings. And then I guess the last module is really looking at the financial rationale. How do you how do you get the money to do this? <laughs> um, what mechanisms are out there? Uh, what types of software or people can advise you as to what is the best financial and also, you know, um, the carbon carbon emissions costs, so not just, you know, monetary costs, uh, to help you make the, uh, the best decision when you want to set off in your project. The other main course that we do offer is the Retrofit Coordination course. Now, this is the course that is, uh, I think we launched at the beginning of the year. Um, and it basically equips businesses and people who are interested in using the PAS process. Now, the PAS process is basically a risk assessment process that the government has brought in to try and encourage the uptake of Retrofit um, and uh, give a, a consumer, I guess, confidence in doing retrofit. Uh, but here in this course, we tend not to just look at the role of, the new role of retrofit coordinator. We look at everybody who's involved in the retrofit process. So that's the designers, the assessors, the installers, the client. So it's a perspective of, you know, how do you look at a risk assessment, a risk, uh, a good risk assessment process and put that into your project? So. Um, it's not just for looking at the retrofit coordinator role. So we think that there is a wider base of people needing knowledge of how to do retrofit better um, rather than just the funded projects, which is what the PAS is alluding to certain projects under government funding. Um, so these are some of the things, the uh, modules that are there. And obviously you, you see it's from inception to completion of a project and it helps with uh, basically trying to um, work out unintended consequences so that they don't happen and you haven't done one measure as opposed to another um, and then have to undo it. So it's about you know working out a longer term plan for a project. Um, one of our, I guess, partnership projects is doing CPT with various um, uh, providers out there and we do one in PHPP for those that don't know what that is it's the planning house planning package and it's a software to help you test during design stage and your project how to actually go through uh, assessing a building before you even start to build it so you know uh, is your analysis and your design intent working as well as retrofit course and what the carbon emissions and costs would be um I guess uh we have a lot of I guess professionals that have done uh, are safe designers, so where they are, um, you can do their passive house designers uh, or tradesperson, tradespeople who maybe haven't come along and actually worked on a building right through. 
So this, this course allows them to actually take one building and use the whole process and software to work out how to come out with the best results. And then we do bespoke courses. Uh, we've recently done some for BEST uh, in Scotland, whereby we are doing uh, an introduction to retrofit to anyone. So the first introduction, what does retrofit mean? And the second one being a fabric first approach. What does that mean to your building and how important is that to look at um, any alterations and how do you go about assessing the fabric of your building? And lastly, I guess, is what are we doing right now? I mean, that's our training, but what we do is we do advise government. Uh, we've worked with Bays and various other uh, building depart uh, government departments, BSI, et cetera, to try to contribute towards, you know, using low energy building standards and incorporating it, what they're trying to do. We do contribute to research quite a lot. Uh, we work with local authorities to try and introduce or use low energy standards when they're building. So having a target is very important in your mind um, to see if you can achieve the highest standards possible. Um, I'm delighted to hear that Renfrewshire Council has adopted the ACB retrofit standard for three and a half thousand homes coming on board um, in Scotland uh, for retrofit. We train professionals um, in the various things that I've talked, certifying standards, past 2035, stock modelling, embodied energy, carbon costing. And we do work in partnership with awarding bodies and other tra training providers where we have helped make courses and, uh, you know, in their initial st stages or worked as advisors um, just to share our knowledge over our membership and ourselves and help design for the training, whether it's CPD, individual modules, micro-credentials, or other courses. Um, our new venture is setting up local partnerships with people for advice, training, and practicals. So that's coming out soon as a pilot scheme to see if we can have more regional areas or more um, ACB members within their areas, like um, Yorkshire. We've had some talks with the Yorkshire ACB membership. Um, uh, but we're looking at Hereford at the moment as a first pilot scheme to try and see if we can set up more regional centres to help people gain the knowledge that they need for what stage they are at in their projects or, you know, just trying to understand to decrease the energy bills. Well, I've never talked so fast in my life. <laughs> That's me come to an end. So um, if you have any queries, I'm happy to answer them now. Or, you know, if, if you think of a few later, please contact us at training at acb.net. Thank you, Trish. That was extremely thorough and interesting. And yes, a lot to take in. I, I didn't realise you were actually doing that much, uh, such a broad range of different things. We have a question from the audience and Linda is asking whether the 10 large house builders are also listening, learning and putting this into practice. Is this something that you would know about? Well, <laughs> I think, I think the, uh, the diplomatic <laughs> uh, answer to that is some are interested. Um, the, the construction industry takes up, like when I said earlier about being demand led, you know, we do need the commissioning of the big companies to change the way that they work. They have to look at efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, some are happy to talk to us, others are business as usual, they put a price in and then they'll say, oh, retrofit coordinator, we need you, or oh, retrofit designer, we need you, and they've already put the price in. And yeah. you can't, you know, stick a, you know, a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work. You've not got, they've got to be in on the ground floor. So these commissioners and people who are commissioning buildings are vital for us to change, you know, uh, in a large way within the construction industry. So it's, it's happening, but it's happening slower than we'd like. So do you keep a database of the kinds of buildings that you deal with? I, I thought the, it know, did we, occur to me that knowing about local buildings, um, sure. each with their own properties, might be a really useful tool for people to it have is. access to. Yeah, that's a very good question. Stock modelling is really important. Uh, we are custodians of the low energy building database, uh, which I can give you information uh, when uh, on the on the PowerPoint if people want to view it afterwards. Um, it's open for everybody to look at, and it is all manner. I think it's nearly five hundred different types of buildings and projects. 
So how to do your own projects, the course, what happened, how they did it. So it's all set out. We are updating it, but it's a fund of information and a lot of our members use it. I'm sure our audience would love to get their hands of that kind of information. And we've, we've also seen um, there was um, an Arab presented one scheme. Was it Arab? Um, or was it civic engineers? It might have been civic engineers who, who presented uh, the way that um, the bigger builders actually learned about the building. And they were talking about um, um, Sheffield, um, Park Hill in Sheffield and how the different phases. Um, originally, the first phase was very much about just keeping the bare bones. And then they gradually developed techniques on how to repair the concrete and how to keep the balustrade. And by phase three, they had learned a lot and had actually managed to do a lot more retrofit and a lot less new build, as it were. And that was very interesting. So I, I think these things kind of apply at every level from the individuals to the professionals who are all working yeah, yeah. in it's that It's about direction. sharing knowledge. We all have, we've all got a, you know, even you're, you think, oh, I'm just doing my individual house. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Somebody else has got a house similar like that to your own street or your row or your, you know, your borough. We yeah. have to share the knowledge of what went wrong so people, you can learn from other people's mistakes and we're all learning going forward. Mm -hmm. It's critical. Great. Um, Simon, um, would you like to be taking over... Um, and introduce yourself and say what you're going to be talking about. Hi, um, yes, I'm, I'm Simon Warren. I'm from uh, Leeds Beckett uh, University School of Architecture. I'm an architect and academic. And um, I'm simply going to, uh, in the time I've got, run through some really interesting student work to show how schools of architecture, well, specifically our school of architecture, uh, 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 is it addressing some of the issues that we're that this series talks about? Are you all right sharing? All right, okay, I'll I'll crack on. Okay, is, is that visible to everybody? It is visible. Um, I'm seeing the, the whole PowerPoint menu. Okay. Um, is that better? That is much better. Always, a false, always a false start. <laughs> things. Um, so, well, thank you for the invite, Claude. And uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as I said just, uh, just then, the uh, the work at the School of Architecture and of course we're talking about the education of students who might just be 18 years old when they start with us so it's uh, so this is about um, the beginning of their career and how they become absorbed in the world of architecture and the really important um, things that they have to address whilst they're with us. Now I've lost my doing this I've now lost my notes so I'm really busking it <laughs> because I can't see my own notes so let's see how we do um, <clears throat> so the first thing is to just reinforce that Leeds Beckett School of Architecture is taking uh, uh, these issues of retrofit and reuse rather seriously and uh, we've got that in writing this is from the, uh, the Architects Journal um, just last month. Uh, they visited our degree show and, uh, and stated in the title that they felt our students are rising to the retrofit challenge. Um, and of course, the retrofit challenge is based around the overarching issue of, of climate change. So I'll, I'll come back to some of the things that the AJ um, uh, published about our show um, uh, shortly. Um, I was wondering about the title of, of this um, webinar, Educating the Next Generation. And it made me sort of uh, uh, consider that in fact, we're educating everybody and the next generation, unfortunately, is having to deal with 
the legacy of our <clears throat> lack of action, of our lack of education. So, I, um, so although I know that the the title isn't um, it, it, it is quite specific, um, it then opens up this discussion about who's it educating who, and in fact, we all need to learn. Um, no, no matter what stage of our career, our lives we might be. Um, so I'm not just thinking about the School of Architecture students. I'm thinking about what do we do to educate everybody in, in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, discussion. And it's interesting that um, just a week ago, uh, James Lovelock, who was somebody that uh, learned uh, throughout his life and changed his opinion. If you've read his books, you find that he uh, became increasingly uh, uh, worried and uh, aggressive in his writing because of the lack of action. And he kept learning and educating himself to the age of 103. Uh, he did something quite impressive. He died on his birthday. Oh. Um, so, uh, so there's lots of people that we should be influenced by when we're thinking about uh, education. So I'm going to talk about uh, four things that happen at the School of Architecture and these I'll try and go through really really quickly because I know I'm rambling already because I've lost my notes. <laughs> so the um, uh, so I'm going to talk about live projects which is something specifically I work on and project office and design studio projects, technology modules and a little bit on, on research. So first of all um, I'm going to just show you one live project and explain how it relates to Project Office. Um, so Project Office is a design and research collaboration of staff and students, an architectural consultancy making ethical, social and resilient architecture. And we work with like-minded communities, organisations and individuals. Essentially, it's a school-based architecture practice that I run with a colleague and its participants are students and other collaborators. And I think this is really important in uh, understanding um, climate change and, and retrofit. Um, there's a lot of slides. I'm not going to talk through all the slides. I felt that um, Civic Trust could share these slides afterwards because if somebody wants more detail, it's contained within the slides, hopefully. So um, the only bit I'll read from there is down the bottom. Projects offices approach equips students with a valuable learning experience relating to real world complexities through the vehicle of live projects, while simultaneously supporting the needs of socially engaged organisations. So when we're talking about really serious issues that we tend to um, work on in schools of architecture, we often work in them on it in a theoretical way, but if you work with them in a real way, then your actions actually are more meaningful and your knowledge uh, becomes more valuable, I think. So um, the life project is not option, but to confront the reality of the environment. Because it is real, it can contribute positively or negatively. So what we're saying with life projects is that students like the rest of us are burdened with the probability that their architecture, these live projects, will have a negative contribution. Uh, so CO2 emissions, material choices, embodied energy, effects on existing ecology, et cetera, et cetera. So live projects expose students to a complex reality and charge them with designing responsibly. And we think this is a really important thing um, in education and um, in a live projects. Um, relate to the impact students are actually making in real life. So they've got to take it seriously, not just theoretically. Uh, for those that are interested, we have a website uh, so you can find out much more about Project Office. And just to say, don't look at it just yet, have August off. And the new website is going to be launched in September with much more content. So this is the live project I just wanted to show you. Uh, we've, we've done over 30, not all of them get built. And um, this is uh, a tiny extension for the New Workley Community Centre in Leeds, where we built uh, a new uh, entrance lobby, you know, mainly to freshen it up, but also to function as 
uh, a proper entrance lobby where prams and other things can be put. And the interesting thing about it is uh, because of this sense of everything we do uh, has an impact, the students are kind of drawn to that. And so the, the project was um, based on one student's idea of reusing recycled doors and recycled windows. So you can see just a few images of this. Um, and it's actually quite beautiful. And this is based on how do we use uh, materials that are effectively waste. There's loads I could tell you about this project. It's the whole lecture about this project and how that's going to lead to our next project for the same client. And the next project for the same client is, is a classroom. So we're using the principles of using construction waste to build a much bigger project, uh, which we'll be starting to design with the students in September. So moving on from my projects to design studio projects, I'm mainly going to be talking about my own work with my students uh, in our studio called Citizen Agency. And uh, the theme, you know, there's lots of themes in a design studio because you're trying to give a student a broad learning experience, but certainly issues of climate uh, crisis and materials are really prominent in what we're doing at the moment. So I use these terminologies, adaptive reuse. I'm increasingly using the word reutility. Um, and it refers to the process of reusing an existing building structure or infrastructure for a purpose other than which it was originally built or designed for. And the terminology is really useful, particularly if it's got infrastructure in there, uh, because it opens students up to radical possibilities of how they may reuse um, uh, buildings, other things, oil rigs we've seen, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I think this is important because although the projects are speculative, that they are grounded in uh, looking at how we might approach things in a completely different way. And that's the beauty of being in a school of architecture. You can do that. And hopefully, if the work gets seen and talked about, it can be influential. And also, the idea of this is that when students leave the institution, they take with them that ethos and that learning. And um, I'll just go through some things that are really key to the work we do in our studio. Uh, I think the most amazing architects um, uh, of recent times are Lacaton and Vassell, who are French, and they have a really radical view. Uh, their famous slogan is, never demolish, never remove or replace, always add, transform and reuse. So they take this idea of reuse to the absolute extreme that whatever's there, I'm assuming if they found some asbestos, they might look a little bit differently about it, but they, their starting position is to reuse everything. And, um, and we know that it's really difficult in practice to, to do these things, but people do it. And, and these are, are, are great exemplars. So they say, we never see the existing as a problem we look with positive eyes because there's an opportunity of doing more with what we already have. And I think if we can talk about these people, then it can really start to influence practice a bit more. Of course, if the students know about it, it might influence their practice. I'll show you one of their projects. Uh, this is in Bordeaux. And I think the photograph on, it, on the left is just amazing. So taking that notion of never demolishing, keeping everything. Uh, they have done quite a few projects in France where they take, you know, really standard housing blocks uh, that are problematic, most of it's social housing, and they transform it by keeping it in its entirety, but wrapping a new, um, a, a new structure around it. And it's really uplifting that these spaces can actually completely transform how people live in them. I want no time to read the quotes, but again, the quotes are really fabulous as well. So for me, that's what, you know, uh, reuse, reutility, whatever you want to call it, 
uh, means when it's done really creatively that you can be transformational. You're not just saving something, you are being transformational. Then another book that we uh, use in studio, and this really is talking generally, um, there's many books a bit like this, but um, to explain that there are overarching issues, you know, why do we want to keep uh, everything? Not just because it's a nice idea or because it's just keeping the context, but we've got to understand that we do, that we try and do this within a really difficult context of uh, how the economic system works. It's important for students to understand how the economy works, how capitalism works. So we, um, we ask students to read books like This Changes Everything by uh, Naomi Klein. And, uh, and I think this is a book that everybody should be reading. Uh, it, uh, the New York Times says, uh, and I can't see all of my screen at the moment, so forgive me, uh, savages the idea that we will be uh, saved by new technologies or by an incremental shift away from fossil fuels. Her solution requires a radical reconfiguration of our economic system. I think what's really interesting is the talk that we've just had uh, about this, the specificness of looking at existing buildings and the detail and knowledge that you need. It has to be funded and it is within a political and economic system. And in fact, we've got to work at changing that economic and political system uh, to free up you know, better opportunities to, to save the planet and, and uh, introduce these ways of working. And I just link in Naomi Klein with something she said, um, and I think this is really important, um, that uh, she explains how she's been inspired by a new, very young generation of protesters. So when we've got this question about um, uh, uh, educating the next generation, actually the next generation is already educating us and our students come in at 18 and they already have ideas of how they want it to be educated because this is really meaningful stuff to them. And you can see that really coming through. So we are seeing in architecture representation through uh, uh, through organisations, pressure groups like ACAN, and we found last week that an architectural worker for the first time became the RIBA president. So the context in which we're educating as, you know, you know I'm, I'm in my late 50s now, as someone who's a bit older, is that our students are demanding this. It's not just us saying, this is how we're going to do it, because this is what we know. We're doing it in part in response and collaboration with, uh, with younger people. Hopefully I've got a little bit of time just to show you how we have worked in our studio. This year, uh, we did uh, an ideas competition called uh, Reutility, using grain bins to find a new purpose. So I'm just explaining, just showing the kind of work we're doing to show that we are taking it seriously and a lot of um, work with existing buildings is undertaken in, in, in our School of Architecture. So I, I won't go through any of this in detail, just to show these photographs of uh, Kansas in the States, context completely different, loads of redundant uh, grain bins, and the competition was to repurpose these. So we did this in our studio as a short competition. Again, you can look at these things later. And uh, so th this is a one student project. Again, I, I haven't time to go through it in detail, but um, they found uh, a, a unique method of integrating the community in the town that this project was set and various ways of using uh, techno uh, re uh, reuse technologies uh, like rammed earth, finding out what was made in the town, et cetera, and utilizing them in this community building, uh, reusing these grain bins. So it's, there's a lot of depth of work in a project like this, and um, they go into detail about materials, how you put them together, uh, discussions about carbon, uh, et cetera. And you can see there, uh, you know, the, the, the complexity in the axonometric. 
And it's, you know, so part of this is, you know, is thinking about where do the material, these new materials come from? There's on-site materials they use and, and materials from uh, uh, local sources. Some of them materials you would not expect to be used in buildings. Um, and then, you know, we just to fly the flag of our studio and school of architecture, uh, uh, that project won the competition. And the other projects we entered, we entered three other projects and uh, all three of the other projects picked up prizes um, as well. Uh, the year before we did uh, another competition uh, in this time in Philadelphia, it feels like we're a bit hung up on working in the States, but that's not entirely the case. We do projects in Leeds. And this was um, a, a, a master plan for a refiner, an oil refinery in Philadelphia that was redundant. So as a group work, we did some, uh, we, did, uh, we did a master plan and then each student took part of the master plan and developed their own individual proposals. So this is a crazy, cr lovely but crazy project um, from Luke who um, kept um, a gasometer and turned it into Philadelphia's kind of music center. And uh, although, you know, it's quite speculative, what we make sure we do with students is that they understand, um, we understand the implications for the work. So one of the pieces of work I ask all our students to do is a materials flow drawing. So there's three things they need to think about, energy, people and materials and their connectivity. So this drawing starts to establish where, uh, if we're thinking in a more rounded sense about how we reuse buildings, where do the workers come from? Uh, how are they trained? Where do the materials come from? And in this project, uh, can you see my cursor, by the way? We can, we can. Right, okay, so in this project, this is Luke's individual projects, but as part of the master plan, there is a building here which recycles materials from the oil refinery. So in theory, if this ever happened, Luke's constructors would go to this building to collect recycled materials from the overall site and use them in the project. So we're constantly getting to think about, even at BA, um, the implications of their designs. So whether that's new build or, or, or reuse, where do these materials come from? How do you um, uh, reuse them? What methods are, um, are needed to do that? So there's a holistic approach and understanding that everything's connected. And then we reinforce that in our technology modules. Uh, so that if you take a speculative project uh, like the one we've just seen, we go further into understanding how the technology will actually work. So this is a more detailed uh, understanding uh, and, uh, of, of a project. And again, I won't go through this in any detail, but this is uh, Howard's project in, in, in Argentina. And I just want to just show and tell really that there's a level of complexity and uh, a detailed design and research that will go into any of these projects. So you can see here, this is his material strategy for, for his project. And then I just want to briefly mention how this ties into the agendas of staff. Uh, we all have a research agenda. We're all researchers in our own right. And this research informs the design studios uh, I've just been talking about. And I just want to mention a colleague of mine, Ian Fletcher. So Ian uh, is about to complete his PhD uh, researching mushrooms, so mycelium as a building material. And in an article he's just recently um, written for The Conversation, he says cement alone is responsible for a whopping 8% of global CO2 emissions. Compare this to the much maligned global aviation industry, which emits 2%. Buildings and by association, the construction industry are profoundly responsible for climate change. And of course, if we've got existing buildings of which we know, uh, uh, you know 
I can't remember the statistic, I've taken it out, but by 20, in 2050, 80% uh, of buildings already exist by the time we get to 2050. So you can see, we know why it's really important. And what Ian does is he brings this research into his own design studio. So looking at how new materials might be formed in the future. So mycelium is one of them, and he'll talk about other waste materials as part of that. And that informs students' learning and decision-making. So getting back to the article in uh, the recent Architects Journal, uh, this was a visit by the AGA to our end of year exhibition, a celebration of student work. The first time we've been able to do it for three years because of COVID. So we had a very good time. Um, and uh, he, uh, so that is his headline. And uh, you can see that uh, this is a kind of output you would get from our students, lots of models uh, working with uh, lots of existing buildings. And also to say, we also have an interior architecture course, which has been going for quite a number of years. So that is specifically using uh, in all of its projects, uh, uh, existing buildings and existing structures. And so uh, this is what the AGA say after visiting Leeds uh, show and recognising that almost all of the undergraduate students have been addressing issues of underused, uh, ru ruined or tired structures, existing buildings or places. And my final slide is, having busted through without any notes at all, because I've, I, I, I can't see any of them. So when I go back over them, I'm sure there are things I'd want to see again. All of this is uh, to celebrate um, our, uh, our, our students' um, possibilities. Uh, they are amazing. They come to us with strong ideas of how they already see the future. And our job is to support them on that journey. Obviously, we've got skills and knowledge uh, through our experiences and, uh, and the School of Architecture is a community where we all come together and think about what that future needs to be. It's going to be really difficult for them because it's not getting any easier, as we know. And this is simply a slide from uh, our students' uh, presentation to the Philadelphia architecture and urban design community a year ago. Again, it had to be done online because of COVID. Um, and they were amazing. And they were talking about their uh, reuse projects of that oil refinery and how they could think about transformational ways of thinking about architecture. Um, the School of Architecture gives them the freedom to be able to speculate and really think about big ideas despite their relative, uh, re re relative youth. And I think that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon. This was um, this was amazingly inspiring, and I it it does open up in a way that often doesn't come up in practice. The whole agenda of what might be done with existing buildings and actually looking into repurposing, recycling, reusing all these other issues, which are less prominent when one talks practically about a, a normal standard retrofit project. So it's incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Um, we have um, Irene Bauman in the audience who is asking, who first of all is saying um, it's wonderful to see how the education of architects has progressed and who is asking whether um, the whether you know if other schools are following on in the same way and whether RIBA are changing their learning output requirements to lead the way. Hi Irene. Um... I don't, well, I reckon so. I think there's two things going on here. I think students are now coming in with uh, more of an agenda of what they want from their education, what they want from life. They, you know, they, they, they read about this and see it and they can see the problems coming their way. It's quite scary for them. So I think we've already got a demand from students and we're seeing that. Um, in terms of, uh, how other schools of architecture are 
I think there's two things here again. I mean, there's, there's the climate emergency, which is the overarching thing, and refit or reuse sits within that. So I think most, uh, most universities are tackling this, uh, some better than others. I've seen uh, some really poor examples when I've been external examining where it doesn't even cross the threshold. That has to change. And in other situations, I've been blown away by the work I've been seeing. And some of this work is going to have influence um, further down the line, I'm sure. Um, I think Leeds itself uh, as has just kind of come to the conclusion, a number of academics talking together, that um, we would have more of a focus on reusing existing buildings. Um, and so I think we might be um, one, one of the few that have taken it on in such a broad way. Uh, so I'm, I'm really quite happy with the output across all our studios uh, in terms of looking at um, existing infrastructures, buildings. So as you know, um, Tom Vigar was working in Marsden with his students. Keith Andrews is working in, in Liverpool. And they're all looking, you know, we've always looked at context as a really important thing, but that context then becomes uh, better regarded in its fabric once you see how important it is to uh, live with what's already there in a more profound way. In terms of the RIBA, uh, let's see. Um, they, uh, there's lots of things happening at ARB and RIBA. Some of it born out of the climate emergency, some of it born out of Grenfell, et cetera. So uh, we know that we've already been asked by the RIBA to um, do two things. One is to make professional studies 10% of the course. So that relates to competence out of Grenfell, but also to make sustainability um, a, a focus of every module as well. So that's that's happening. But I always think RIBA are catching up with what's happening on the ground because I think schools of architecture, in my experience, were already there. And OK, it might influence those that are lagging behind a bit. So I think I think the work the, the RIBA's uh, changes so far are really picking up the stragglers in architectural education, not those that are leading. That's a very interesting way of concluding, in fact. Um, we have uh, Sophie of the Carbon Co-op, who's going to be talking about educating builders. And um, I, I think one of the action gaps um, in the whole chain of what's been observed so far would actually be in the, the business plans and for particularly for builders. So it's not just a case of the skills, but how you quantify, how you assemble, how you uh, in, in a world that is very risk averse and very uh, cautious about taking risks, uh, particularly with regard to funding. So perhaps at this stage, I should um, um, introduce Sophie. Or Sophie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, thank you, Claude. Um, That's excellent. Um, my name is Sophie Norton, and I'm going to do my best to share my screen now. Um, so, does that look okay? That looks fine. Great. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I have had a look at the audience. I don't think I know many people, so I thought I would quickly um, just let you know a bit more about who I am um, and uh, why I'm talking to you today. Um, and then I'm going to go on to talk about retrofit risk. So thank you um, for talking a bit about risk, Claude. Um, and then the mit mitigation in place. And some of this will repeat a little bit of what um, Trish talked about. But my presentation is a bit different. Hopefully, people will find it useful. Um, and then I'm going to come on to supply chains um, and the training that I've been involved with. Um, 
So I have worked in the heritage construction sector since 2009. Um, I first worked at the University of York and delivered heritage training projects around Yorkshire. Um, and since 2015, I've worked for Historic England um, and I've been really pleased to help develop um, major projects like the Hamish Ogston Foundation Heritage Building Skills Programme, um, where we've got funding to upskill um, 40 trainees across the north of England um, and give them real um, hands-on opportunities at Heritage at Risk sites. Um, I led on this at Historic England until April, um, and now I'm seconded to the Carbon Co-op for three days a week. So my substantive role is still at Historic England, um, where I still um, am involved in skills challenges um, for heritage, heritage in the construction sector. Um, but the other three days a week I spend at Carbon Co-op, um, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about um, retrofit and how that's practiced and how um, how upskilling um, can be best done. Um, uh, and so I'm coming at you, I'm talking to you from Carbon Co-op, but I bring kind of to bear my experience of Historic England as well. Do note I'm not a technical profession at Historic England, my role is all about skills. Um, and then, and yeah, so very focused on retrofit in both roles, skill solutions at Historic England, and then delivering an area-based scheme at the Carbon Co-op. Um, so this is just a bit of a gratuitous fun for me. So um, the Hamish Augustine Foundation programme that I've been involved in developing is um, all about job creation, basically. So you can see the picture on the right. Um, all those little purple circles are places where we have placed um, heritage construction workers in existing heritage firms so that they can learn um, the trade of their choice, whether it be stonemasonry or mill writing or carpentry and joinery. Um, and we do have one opportunity to bring them together at um, summer schools. We're at Wentworth Woodhouse today, actually. I was hoping I'd be in a bit of a nicer environment, but I'm in the kitchen. Um, but we are working on the Ionic Temple, which is the um, building on the top left. Um, and the reason I'm kind of talking to you about that is because that, that, that project is based on job creation largely. Um, and that works in the heritage construction sector because even though it's a sector that suffers from long-standing skills shortages, it is a functioning sector um, and, and at the moment uh, the retrofit sector is much less mature and so my feeling is and I think and I think some of the evidence is there that that um, we need a slightly different approach that um, that that job creation um, I think job creation has its place um, but maybe our priority at first should be upskilling and I'll try and explain that in a sec I've got, I was going to do a quick quiz um, sorry, someone just comes to the kitchen. Um, I was going to do a quick quiz, uh, and I'd, I'm not sure how um, interactive this is, so I'm just going to let, let everybody do their own self um, self marking. Um, so, uh, and I know that Trish covered a lot of this anyway. Um, but does anyone know what percentage of the UK's carbon emissions come from the built environment? That's my first question. You could have a couple of seconds. Um, <laughs> nearly this twenty have to come just Q and A, so <laughs> we shall see all chats. Yeah, you can, yeah, feel free to send them in. There's no prizes, so no pressure. Um, this, what proportion of this is from housing um, rather than kind of commercial buildings or public buildings? It's really high, uh, around two thirds. And the majority of those buildings are owner occupied. Um, what proportion of those houses were built before 1919, that should say, sorry. Um, uh, again, very high. So it's around 21% in England on average and also 21% in Yorkshire, it does vary from region to region. And finally, what proportion of emissions come from operational as opposed to embodied energy? And I think, I can't actually see that now, but I think it's around 75%. Um, so it's really high. And the, that, and for me, that means that, 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 that one of the clear priorities is around helping owner occupiers, owner occupiers retrofit their buildings because they're the they're the they're the buildings that contribute the most to our carbon emissions. Um, next slide. So, um, but as we've said, retrofit is risky. It's seen as risky. There are some cases that make it feel really risky. Um, and in a heritage context, um, and, in, and, a, and I use the word heritage in a kind of blanket, blanket way, so list of buildings, but also buildings that were bought, built before 1919 and, and perform very differently to modern buildings because largely they were sort of built to breathe. Um, they have very different moisture handling qualities. Um, 
so we get concerned about the immediate harm to character or appearance and you just have to think of external wall insulation on a, on a, on a listed building to kind of recognise that, that risk. Um, but there's also the immediate or long term harm, harm that results because of unintended consequences of changes in performance, which is what Trish also talked about. And that usually, I've said usually, maybe I should soften that sometimes, but that sometimes leads to de decay in historic fabric. Um, but in both areas, and in both areas to kind of mitigate that risk, condition, detail and maintenance of critical importance. So again, what, um, what has been said already, um, that's really important that training takes place at every stage of the supply chain is uh, is really critical because um, it, it, it's, it's not enough to have a fantastic design. If that design isn't implemented flawlessly, I would argue on site, um, it will compromise the kind of performance characteristics and we need to be able to control that so that we don't um, have unintended consequences that compromise significance from a heritage point of view, but, but also compromise performance from an energy efficiency point of view. But with all that risk taken into account, there's also a massive risk around us not meeting net zero if we're too scared of all those risks. So um, we just have to find a way to work through those risks, I think. Um, so unintended consequences, that's kind of the biggie. Um, and uh, the, the, the performance gap is something that's really well known. It, it's not unique to heritage or pre-1919 or even existing buildings. It still happens in, um, in new buildings. Um, and, and, and sometimes we, oh, sorry, the performance gap is where um, uh, the intended energy efficiency and the modeled energy efficiency is not, does not come to fruition on site, basically. Um, so, and, and that can happen for, uh, for many reasons. And, and one of those is that the, the design might not be appropriate for the building. Um, but even in cases where the design is appropriate, um, it can also be because architectural details are not accurately finished on site. Um, and there are lots of reasons why that might happen. And that's not always around training, actually. Sometimes there's time and cost pressures to do things too quickly. And sometimes things are really technically complex. Um, it might make access to do something impossible or something like that. But there are there is lots of argument around the fact that the performance gap, which is a form of unintended consequences, I would argue, Trish might uh, disagree with me, but, but I would argue is something that's unpredicted. It's a kind of form of unintended consequence. Um, some of that can be dealt with by um, by training. And at the very far end, where it's a term that we use at Historic England, is what we call maladaptation. And that, that's something that makes, uh, that might, um, where we take an action, um, we, ta we take an action to mitigate against climate change that actually puts us back a step. But I think that's very unusual. And I prefer to think about unintended consequences and the performance gap and how we can try and close those. Um, and, there, and, and training definitely has a place there. Um, and other things have a place too. So um, the architects among us, and again, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the balance of architects and, and homeowners is here. Um, but And so for the architects, I apologize because this is forcing you to absolutely suck eggs. Um, but there are mitigation um, me methods in place um, to help protect consumers, like Trish said. Um, and I consider those uh, at the very basic level. We have the building regulations. You know, most works that uh, that a lot of, well not most I can't go that far but a lot of energy efficiency works do have to comply with building regulations so we consider that kind of the basic standard um, and then we have a better which is the British standards and um, in a pre-1919 environment which is really all I can talk about um, but we have the guide to the conservation of historic buildings which talks about the importance of performance but we also have the um, British standard on workmanship which I think is so important in a retrofit context because of that need to execute designs flawlessly in order to close the performance gap um, and then uh, better we have the public the past 2035 which uh, again Trish mentioned which is about retrofitting dwellings for improved energy efficiency um, and we also have past 2038 which I haven't mentioned there but I have mentioned later um, which is about non-dwellings and the very bestest which I only found about recently is that Bayes themselves have published um, several guides on specific energy efficiency measures so there's kind of like weighty documents about um, how um, things like external wall insulation can be installed. So that's what I consider the hierarchy and the two I think are of most use, um, well, the two that are kind of the, of interest to me are the debate of past 2035 and the building regulations alongside the, the planning, the planning laws that protect heritage buildings. Um, so they're the key standards um, when working in a kind of pre-1919 environment. The building 
the building regs, heritage planning, and then past 2035 and past 2038. Um, now, past 2035 and past 2038, I mentioned they're the better. That's because they don't apply. At the moment, they are only really being used on publicly funded projects. So that the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, funding for households and fuel poverty, and, and they're most likely to be private rented or social housing and public buildings. But what did we say right at the beginning? That the majority of buildings that are contributing to our emissions are about our um, uh, owner-occupied housing. And, and we haven't quite cracked that yet. So um, past 2035, this is, this is broadly speaking, it sets out different roles that have to be undertaken um, in order to close that performance gap. Um, you have a client, you also have a lead retrofit professional that's kind of overseeing somebody that assesses the site in order to have an understanding of what that building can actually cope with to then design the works and then um, install the works. And um, past 2038 uh, isn't as kind of, um, like, it's, it's not as, um, the different roles aren't um, discussed as kind of um, in as great a depth, I think, as past 2035, and, and, I, and I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but I suppose I haven't tried to unpick that really, because I think dwellings are the place where the greatest risk is. So let's move on to 2035. Um, and this is where we kind of look at the different roles set out in past 2035. So we have the client, and then we have a retrofit coordinator that's already been mentioned. Um, the retrofit coordinator um, oversees, uh, or co no, not oversees necessarily, but, but coordinates the assessor, a designer, a builder, an evaluator, and then the, the operators work for that builder. Um, and I should say that these, these roles have functions but they can be, be performed by the same person and quite often are. Um, but it's, it's kind of useful that they have those different functions that they do different things. So the assessor looks at the building and says, this is what the building could take. The designer then designs the retrofit measures and the coordinator is that person that helps uh, make sure that those designs are executed uh, flawlessly by the builder. And the evaluator then kind of looks at how the energy efficiency measures have been achieved and that's how we get an understanding of whether or not we've um, closed the performance gap. Um, so that's how it's supposed to work and that is really great and has been working and it has been used a lot on social housing but we still have this question what about owner-occupied buildings because when we look at the supply chain for owner-occupied buildings quite often um, uh, owner occupiers might not involve an architect when they're doing re re energy efficiency measures and retrofit measures they might not involve a designer and they might talk directly to a builder who then subcontracts some work and in those instances it's possible that only building control and the local authority conservation officer if there is, if it's like a listed building or a um or a conservation area building would be involved um and so I think I think what we have to be trying to do is um, get to a place where we are trying to get look at these roles that are in red um, and in, help those roles get the knowledge they need to perform those roles that are identified in past 2035. If you see what I mean, um, so that's where that's where um, that's where we've got to. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing at Carbon Co-op and People Powered Retrofit to, to, to do that. Oh, first I'm going to do another little quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's all right. So, um, how, and again, we've touched on this. So how many workers does the CITB estimate the construction sector needs to meet the retrofit challenge? Um, it is a lot. So uh, 350,000. And that's probably in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, what proportion need upskilling? Um, around half of this. So again, I go back to that original point about job creation having its place, but 50% of this immature market already needs upskilling. And so I would argue that that's the thing that 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 where there's a real priority, where there's a priority, because if you have a to, to do job creation, we need to have a fairly healthy um supply chain already and if and and it would be asking a lot of an immature supply chain to train people from scratch rather than upskilling 
Um, and then what proportion need to learn about pre-1919 buildings? And that's not yet known, but Historic England is working on it. So do look out for that. Um, the Carbon Co-op. So uh, this is the work I'm doing at the Carbon Co-op. Um, and we are delivering an area-based scheme in a, an area of South Man Manchester for people that are unable to pay, that should say around 12, unable to pay demonstrator households. Um, they're pre-1919 buildings largely. We haven't exactly selected them, but we know broadly speaking where they will be um, and we are going to focus on people that are living in fuel poverty or vulnerable to fuel poverty um, and also on small clusters of, um, of houses hopefully two ideally two clusters um, and that's because we would like to act as a client intermediary which means we will bulk procure the works from a single contractor uh, so, sorry, with a single contract um, and manage the works on behalf of the householders. We're hoping to be able to work across tenure, so with owner occupiers and with um, uh, people living in private rented, possibly and possibly social housing, because um, that's we think that's what will make it a truly area based scheme. Um, contractor will directly employ their staff and they will benefit from evaluated and accredited on the job training so I think that's really important like we the, I, I really liked the this the, um, the the kind of comment about Park Hill um, and, I, and I and I think there's lots of examples of that indeed one of um, one of Carbon Co-op's um, previous retrofit projects, they found through the delivery of 12 um, retrofits on homes across Greater Manchester that the supply chain did exactly that. They got much, much faster and they were really good at it. We're not very good at quantifying that, actually. Um, so I think we, we, want, we want to deliver accredited training alongside on the job training and really have an understanding um, of what people have learned and how they've used it and what impact it has on the business. Um, and the, the, one of the qualifications we'll be looking at is the level three award in energy efficiency measures for older and traditional buildings. Um, that's something that is much mentioned. It was, it was mentioned alongside the AEBC carbon light course um, in the government's um, heat and building strategy last year. Um, and, in, and in this country, it's, it's embedded in past 2035 um, for some of the design and assessor roles if people are working in a pre-1919 or designated environment in Scotland there's also a suggestion that it should be it should that 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 qualification should be achieved by installers as well so we've got a little bit of disparity there across the two countries um, and, and, and we would like to deliver that for um, some of our uh, workforce um, and then Carbon Co-op, uh, it's, it's an innovator. It's done a lot of things in the retrofit space over the last 12 years as a way of helping people from across Greater Manchester um, save on its carbon, save on their carbon emissions for climate change. And one of its projects has been um, the development of an organization called People Powered Retrofit, which, oh, sorry, there's some of the houses in Levensume <laughs> that we will be working on. So solid wall buildings, very kind of typical of Manchester. Um, and then, um, uh, so this is People Powered Retrofit, so it's a paid for service available to anyone that can meet that payment and it's a one stop shop for retrofit assessment, design and coordination um, and it gives owner occupiers access to the expertise um, that they need really to design and procure um, works but and alongside that they also train contractors around greater manchester um, to prepare the supply chain um, and there's a huge demand for that service um, so even though i think even though we argue that the supply chain for this isn't is nascent and it's demand led um, there's kind of um, the other side of it from pipe people powered retrofits point of view is there is lots of demand but people just don't know how to go about it they cannot find the people to help them do it um, and then so what can I do? I think there's, there's so much that we can do um, in, in this area. Um, and, I, and I think for me, it's been really valuable learning about the different roles in past 2035, um, considering who would undertake them if I was doing a project, um, making sure you have expertise available throughout to design, and then make sure that your designs are installed exactly. I and mean, if you are undertaking any of those roles in past 2035, consider the relevant CPD and encourages others undertaking those roles to do the same and then um, I think Trish made a really good point about sharing learning um, and I have 
absorbed so much learning over the last two years. I'm currently doing the carbon light course that Trish talked about. Um, and there's also loads of good resources on Carbon Co-op's website, Historic England's website, the London Energy Transformation Institute, People Powered Retrofit are currently um, offering training. Um, and then the STBA has got loads of good resources as well. And I, was just, I would just recommend absorbing it as much as possible and encouraging others to do the same all the way down the supply chain. Excellent. Um, we, we're running very, very short of time, and this has been this has been a lot to take in. Actually, between all three speakers, um, I've learned quite a lot today, and I think we would all end up having to do one of these courses in one way or another. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on um, what Simon had mentioned, and I think this is something that, as architects and designers, we worry about a lot. Um, how do you create a new economic system that is going to convince all these trained builders and these trained professionals into taking the risk? And I, I just loved the way you turned around the whole risk assessment um, question. Um, are, are, are there new business models, uh, new socioeconomic systems that are being investigated in order to convince that workforce to to join. Do you want a one word answer? Oh, go on, go on, Simon. Well, I, I, well, the thing is, I mean, this is the, this is the, the quandary that has existed even before we had a climate emergency, really, because it's, it's bigger, it's, you know, uh, it's bigger than the climate emergency is having, um, again, it's um, a fairer global system where people have access to their needs and feel safe. I mean, it's the big overarching thing of you know the world and society, and it's it, it's brought more into focus when there's a climate emergency. So, as a as a humble architect, um, I don't have answers to that. Uh, how I go about it is, um, I think. Well, I think one of the things is I think you know all the speakers are doing their bit. Okay, so they've found their way of making change happen. So that has to be applauded so we know um uh, we know you know that's happening and uh, and there's some amazing work uh, uh, being done and and this is why i think reading if you know it's 600 blooming pages long so if uh, it's, it's um it's really worth reading Naomi Klein's uh, this changes everything um because it talks about where change is happening. So I haven't got any specific examples, but uh, you know, globally, she cites amazing examples where the people have taken on the authorities and won. And she shows that you know, with, without those people actually massively losing out, you can make that change. And uh, so it, it, it just needs everybody to you know, to be exposed to those values, really. And I think part of the problem we've got is, um, you know, people aren't being exposed to those values. To the contrary, you know, if you look at uh, current politics in the UK, the opposite is happening. That You know, the big voices of persuasion are this horrible, um, you know, uh, media uh, group of moguls. So I don't have a, a ready answer for that. And there's thousands of people who've written about it um, who are of a bigger... Uh, intellect than me you know and, and we we know who some of the big names in that are but I think um you know something has to change because we uh, you know we're heading to oblivion aren't we so um I I, I just I actually don't know and it's I, James Lovelock's fascinating because he knew so much about it and he got to the point where he actually has given up. He said, I can't write any more about this stuff because nobody's listened. So you can take that pessimistic view or maybe a realistic view that he thinks it's too late or he thought it was too late. And no matter what we do, everything we've talked about today is actually irrelevant because it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Um, and then you read, and then I just you know, flip flopping to uh, Naomi Klein, that just filled me with inspiration that if you do your bit in your locality, et cetera, and uh, uh, that can um, have a valuable effect. And if that grows, then maybe lots of small things happening together 
make a more humane society. Uh, the alternative is, uh, is, is revolution. Um, and who knows what's you know who knows what's coming next so I, um but in bringing it back a little bit to you know our conversations today I, I i think you know we've got to do it in schools of architecture we've actually got to do it earlier um and uh and i think schools want to do it i think schools uh politically and ideologically are hindered because i don't think the government particularly wants students uh, and pupils to learn what's really going on, uh, which is my my personal view. And I think that leads me to the other best book I've ever read, which is uh, on education, and it's called Ped uh, Ped uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. So some people might know that. But if you want to read a book which is, isn't 600 pages long, uh, is about 100 pages long, 120 pages long, it's only little, and, uh, and understand a, 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 a revolutionary educational view of the world, then that's, that's the book. And it was amazingly influential in its time. And, that's, and that book's coming back. So short answer is I've actually no idea how we fix it. Other, um, but it has to be a collective response, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, I don't know whether sometimes I wake up uh, in, in one day, I can be incredibly pessimistic about it and think, why, why bother? And, uh, and sometimes it's usually when students do things uh, that just blow me away. I think it's still worth fighting for. Absolutely. Sounds a bit too profound for a, for a, <laughs> for a Thursday afternoon, but it's difficult. Well, we, we are at this stage talking about the future and and as you say, there is already a huge amount of work that I know wasn't there when I was doing my PhD and I handed in my manuscript in 2017. So I think the world has moved on very, very quickly in recent years and, and hopefully we all get there. Um, we are running short of time, um, but Irene Bauman is going to be um, reflecting on all these issues for us next week to wrap up the entire series. Uh, for the audience or for any of the um, people who've given us wonderful presentations, um, most of the webinars are already on the Leeds Civic Trust YouTube website. So you just enter Leeds Civic Trust YouTube and it will take you there if you want to go back. And, uh, and Irena will be um, also trying to future, and we're all in that same situation. And I think it's a question of actually just trying to come up with as many ideas as possible and trying them out as all of us are trying to do at the moment. So I shall leave you for, oh, um, there was a technical question. Um, somebody had asked um, where the website was for, um, for finding out about buildings, the 500 different types of buildings that Trish Andrews was talking about. And the website is called loweredgybuildings.org.uk. So I shall see you all next week. Um, thank you again for these contributions, which were very inspiring. And I shall see you next week, hopefully. Bye for now. <laughs>